Hello and welcome to this edition of Chat with Chair. We are delighted to have with us uh, someone from actually the Northeast, and this is the first time we having someone from the Northeast on this uh, Chat with Chair uh, series. It is Mr. Ranjit Barthakur, who is the chairman of the FICI Northeast Advisory Council. He is also the uh, chairman of Globally Managed Services. He is an advisor to Tata Consultancy Services. Uh, he has been the, the chairman of Tata T earlier. Uh, he is currently the chairman of Rajasthan Royals, the IPL team. He has established uh, many social sector environmental focused uh, organizations, including the Balipara Foundation. So welcome Ranjit uh, to this very special edition of Chat with Chair. Thanks. Thanks, Dilip. Thank you for, for doing this for the Northeast and thank you for actually the chat with the chair because I think it's a it's a great way to come for us to communicate our needs and for others in case they want to follow up uh, with us to give them opportunities and support any of our members across the country or the world. Okay, so thank you for that. And you know, I like to begin by just getting your sense. You know, we've had uh, two waves of the pandemic: the last wave and the current wave. So if you were to look at it, you know, how has the pandemic actually affected the Northeast? You see, it, it meaning the question itself is a difficult one because the pandemic has affected everybody economically and socially. But more importantly, it's affected people mentally. And I really think that the mental stress, and we had a program on the largest TV channel here yesterday, is saying that why isn't there a positive news channel in this negative news? Because if you look at it, Earlier, we knew places. Now we know people who are passing on. So there's a big transition from how the pandemic has affected people. In terms of basically the social impact of this, the negative social impact, I think has been greater because human beings as such are trained from the beginning to go outdoors, whether you are in school, whether you are in college, you're saying outdoors, what's your activity? How do you mix with people? Haven't you gone out? Suddenly for that to be restricted, and to be uh, curtailed is really the challenge which every human being is going through. And the Northeast is no uh, different. What has happened, however, family bonding wherever you're with your family and the viewership of discussions around the audiovisual medium seem to have gone up. The IPL was a great uh, breather. Uh, and in fact, its penetration and delivery was a big relief to us in the Northeast. Uh, and I just think that uh, as you go along, the the COVID second wave is uh, more challenging. It's affected more people, but not for lack of trying. I think the government have actually cast a very strong net and have increased the kind of vigilance through testing and through the social norms of masking, hand washing and vaccination. So I think these are the four step process that the government has done and has penetrated everywhere. The rural areas primarily surrounding tea gardens are the ones which are <clears throat> been affected and the government there also has created good SOPs for the TS states and rural areas to do it. So I think everybody is doing their best, you know. So I, it's, it's not as bad as people make out other than the social side, but the economic side, of course, uh, has been disastrous. If you go by sector, this is a very highly dependent tourist sector that's been affected. Has production of tea been affected? Yes. To, a, to an extent, not badly because the production continues, but with a lot of social norms. Therefore, productivity is uh, reduced in tea. In terms of the oil sector, production continues because there's a continuous flow in which you can actually have social distancing and continue. So the tourism sector has been badly affected and the value chain of tourism, as you know, has the greatest multiplier wherever that is. So whether it is uh, meaning natural tourism like Kaziranga, Manas, etc., or whether it is religious tourism, it has been greatly, I think, uh, affected and therefore the value chain challenged. If you look at, therefore, the retail sector, that's been challenged. If you look at the entire process of smaller and small and medium production houses, whether it be iron and steel factories, whether it be <clears throat> the entire factory of food conversion and processing, that has been affected. Whether you look at the entire process of uh, transportation, which is small transportation, three-wheeler transportation, whether mechanized or human-led, uh, has been also very badly affected. So if you look at it by sectors, I think all sectors are differentially 
impacted some sectors to the extent of 100 and some sectors to the extent of only 10 or 20 the sector which is done well which is a new sector which has emerged is home delivery how well it is done i don't know but if a hotel sold 100 earlier everything on hotel on on premise seating i think off premise seating has gone up by at least 10 points i think uh, which out of that pie of 100 of hotel some hotels more some hotels less so i think that would be the summary of what it is we thank you for that and you know, at least there are some bright spots in 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 the northeast you know tea production is up i mean it's still continuing the refinery is still continuing and of course this latest statistic about uh, the home delivery is very interesting i think you know your head for numbers i if i remember correctly you were in consulting uh, much much uh, many many years ago uh, so <laughs> Uh, let, let, let me also just turn now, you know, to the healthcare facilities in the northeast. And you have been working with the different governments, uh, state governments, to look at ramping up the health infrastructure. You know, what have you been doing, and what is it that the other FICI membership uh, could actually do and help and contribute in this? See, I think the first one. Uh, let me address. I think the healthcare infrastructure in Assam has been laid out in a much more organized way over the last few years. And our current chief minister has been the health minister for, I think, three terms, uh, of which there was a break he took when he was um, not in the Congress and decided to pursue his career of uh, delivering to the people through the BJP in 2016. There may have been a break. So he has a very good vision, which he laid out. And what he did was created uh, infrastructure, both of teaching and of delivery. So I think the number of medical colleges, number of nursing schools have gone up absolutely uh, unbelievable amount in terms of seats. So if there were earlier two big uh, colleges, now we've got nine uh, medical colleges. So that's a fantastic amount in these last 10, 15 years that have been said about. That also comes with nursing and therefore nursing has been able to help. What also the government did is made it compulsory for people in the final year to go and work in rural areas. So he built capacity along with the hardware for delivering the kind of so uh, software that was required for that. The ASHA system and welfare healthcare workers have also been beefed up and therefore for marginal people who cannot go uh, to hospitals or to the primary health centers for just primary health, secondary or tertiary care, I think they have been able to uh, address that quite a lot. They've also got a disaster management medical team, which actually addresses floods and malaria, all of which actually uh, have its little share in uh, Assam. So I think they built a very good teaching infrastructure, delivered with a very good primary, secondary and healthcare beefed up system, including the Assam Cancer Foundation, which now has got nine or 10 centers, which are under construction, going up to 19 with the Tata group. The Tata uh, Trusts actually supported the health minister then and now chief minister, Dr. Sharma, to build that infrastructure. So in two, three years time, I think we'll be much better off. As of now, we still, there is a yawning gap in terms of actual delivery of what we can. So the mobile system, the entire mobile delivery system of cars, vehicles, ambulances is being used. The tea garden hospitals are being used actually to cater not only to captive population, but also populations around the TST in, in the rural area. So in short, I think we're not short of medicines as such. We're not short of vaccines. As of yesterday, I think they had already done maybe two, three million uh, vaccines. And they had a pipeline of roughly 300,000, uh, which would last them for uh, over four or five days, given the daily rate. And we're getting another at least 1 million to 2 million in the pipeline over the next uh, a few weeks in June. So I think they're pretty much organized for that. In terms of oxygen cover, as I had mentioned in an earlier forum, I think the oxygen cover seems to be there for at least 15 uh, to 45 days, in some cases 45 days. I think on an average, it would be at least a 30-day cover of oxygen, which is also quite good. So overall, I think it's been a good management. However, the third wave is posing a big issue and really it's an appeal to all members. How do we uh, organize PIKU, the, the thing for uh, children, the small uh, wards, you know, five better uh, sort of children's 
intensive care so that we can dispense uh, what you call good health care to them and actually take proactive measures as also reactive if required for any emergency. I think that in a, a nutshell should be quite an encouraging sort of situation and voice for the people of India. I think very good. You know, you've actually focused on Assam, uh, you know, but in the other parts of Northeast, you know, given the distributed uh, nature of, you know, habitation and population, there are very few centers. I mean, what, what is the picture emerging from there and, you know, how could members help? I think all other centers are not uh, as bad as some of the mainline uh, states. And I'll tell you why. See, Assam roughly has a population of 36 to 37 million people. The rest of the Northeast is 10 million. So let us say that out of those 10 million, if it's addressed, you can look at it, Tripura would be the highest population state. And they've done a pretty good job of actually addressing this in a very aggressive manner. As good as Assam? No. So if Assam on a 100 uh, scale, how, uh, how good it is, it may be 60 to 70. Tripura would be 50, you know. So I'm saying Mizoram would be maybe 40, 50. So Meghalaya is a good state again. It has actually a delivery of 70 to 80 uh, again there. Uh, 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 this uh, Arunachal, by just by distances, considering that it spans across the, almost the whole of the Chinese border, is probably challenged because of transportation and delivery. But their systems that they've put into place seem to be quite uh, sort of... Uh, happy. It's not wanting, but they need help in terms of oxygen. They need help in terms of delivery. So I think Assam is helping them because our chief minister is also the head of NIDA, the northeastern states. So it's important that we understand that he is in a way indirectly and directly passing on all the good of Assam to also the good of the northeastern states. So there's a comprehensive eye for a change, which may not have been there earlier. You know, thank you for that. You know, uh, we were earlier talking about the Dubai Expo. Just to mention that we are in talk with the Northeast Council, for the Northeastern states to come as a group participation. You know, one of the floors in the India Pavilion has uh, the states participating, and we are asking the Northeast Council to come in uh, there. But that's uh, not really that's just for information. But uh, you know, if I look at you know, you, when you're talking, you were talking about the tea, and you you said that tea plantations went or continued working, but productivity is slightly low. But if I look at the overall tea industry, and you know you are you're very knowledgeable about this industry. So how do you see the you know the tea industry uh, currently and what is it that we could do to actually increase uh, the profitability on the tea gardens, uh, the profitability across the entire tea value chain and how can you know what could the government do to support uh, this uh, industry? Actually, both, both are interesting. Even Dubai, I think the Northeast Council should definitely participate. Quite naturally, they should take the brand of tea called Assam tea and they should brand it from India, made in India, and they should definitely have a stall pertaining to tea. If they could, they should take a small tea machinery and actually you can be able to that small machinery, put the black tea on one side and it come out with packaged tea in, in five minutes time with the name of the person. So it come out with Fiki or Dilip Chinoy uh, company. So I think that's the kind of gimmick that you need for people to do. It's not expensive. There's, uh, there are two, three companies that do these small machines. So I think we should, just like the West market ourselves a little more different on touch and feel. So I think we should do that. Secondly, I also think that we should talk about biofuels that what Numaligar refinery, understanding that climate change is attacking it. And in fact, what I did uh, write about and speak about and spoke to the chief minister day before was the three Cs. What the Northeast really need is uh, management of COVID, C, COVID. Two is connectivity across the states and also to Bangladesh, because that would be the biggest market of 170 million uh, for, for the Northeastern states. So politics apart, if we get that market, it makes it very easy for us, connectivity. And the third one is climate change. And within climate change, there's a whole new strategy that you can talk about, which I will talk about in a while. And that whole strategy is about rewilding the Northeast. And rewilding means value, valuing nature. So how do you value nature? And I'll discuss that later. So coming back, I think uh, your, your, your second question was about tea. See, tea is a very profitable industry on overall. The question is how people are looking at it. 
earlier all T till the late 60s, all T's were managed by agency houses and companies. What happened is towards the late 70s and 80s, there was a fragmentation of the tea industry for no other reason but because life emerged and it became the, the, the time for agriculture and rural people to innovate. So today, 50% of the tea is made by organized tea, organized, regulated tea industry, that is 300 million, and the other 300 million is made by small growers. The small growers are an extremely profitable segment. So when somebody asks, how is tea doing? I'll say overall is doing very well. It's very profitable because the 300, uh, uh, meaning uh, what do you call million kilos are made by entrepreneurs. So we have created an entrepreneurial farm revolution in the villages. And those guys actually have not only tea, but they have multi-crops. They have betel nut, they have tomato, they have other things. So in fact, it's better for the soil and better for agroforestry and agro tea is much better than the old form of 150 years old of tea, you know, which is which was completely different. That tea is challenged in parts. There is a top end, I think about 15, 20%, they make top end quality. They're very profitable. The middle end, which is producing the, the, the tea for, for the rest of India and for the packeteers has been challenged primarily for three reasons. The cost of manufacture has been going out and the prices have not been going up in line with cost of manufacture. To address that is a long-term uh, uh, idea, and I have been talking to the chief minister, saying that actually we should make every single worker or owner of the tea estate and give the owners a compensation and give them the right that they can actually manufacture. But the tea garden should be given the way the small growers are owners to the workers and they become some the entrepreneurs. So you don't have a problem of, of uh, having a workforce. You have a problem of managing entrepreneurs. That entrepreneurial revolution will also create an infrastructure revolution for 1 million houses. So that's the amount of people that are there. And housing and infrastructure could kickstart the economy. As we know, in most of these economies which are depressed, the more you invest in infrastructure, the more you're likely to revive the economy. So I think there would be a game-gain situation there. Education, healthcare, road systems, water systems, and housing should all be taken and given away uh, to... Uh, the government, because that is what they do for rural areas and neighboring villages. And that is the government's job for which for these services, they should charge uh, what do you call the, the people who are owners of the house, which I'm hoping will become the workers. I did have a chat with the chief minister day before on this, and he always loved the idea. And he always said, when I become chief minister, maybe we'll address it. So this was the time to address it. That will leave for a more sustainable industry because you take out the cost of the workers, and you can actually start manufacturing and you become manufacturing hubs for all the tea garden owners. And you can give even the workers a share of, of that. You, you, you won't be unprofitable. That's my idea. Since you've been mentioning the uh, discussions with the Chief Minister of Assam and the new government has actually taken over there. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would just like, you know, uh, very quickly understand your expectations. Now, you actually talked very highly of the new chief minister when he was health minister. You've talked about how he's looked, heard you on the plantation. But what would be the three things that you think the present government should focus on? One is COVID. That's the most immediate thing. We can't forget that. And that COVID story is likely to last till September, December, especially with the third wave, if it does come, or the fourth wave. But at least it would... In the name of COVID, we should create good healthcare infrastructure, which will address other issues like nutrition, childbirth, IMR, MMR, etc. So I think that with the excuse of COVID, we must manage COVID, but also create great infrastructure, which will create great employment in the healthcare sector of paramedics and medics. So, you know, that's one big uh, situation. Two is there is imminently a possibility to rewilding Assam to address the climate change issue and become net zero. I think that we can at least create a 2 million employment window between year one and year 10. And that window is about creating forests, not by creating um, monoculture teak farms or monoculture plantation, but by creating a 21 variety forest in which there would it would be an asset class. So if, if I said, this housing colony has 20 houses. The finance guy would say, okay, 20 houses, how many square feet? And would say, okay, the value of what you have there is so much. And therefore, we can, we can do something. 
Now, in the forest, if I say to them that, boss, can you value one teak tree and give me a discounted cash flow on it? The guy says no. But I said, why? Because I am going to make from this forest, I will make things, forget making things, just the bare cost of teak in 30 or 50 or 100 years, I can have a discounted cash flow of that. So what we did is we've divided the forest into four asset classes. The first asset class we said is furniture. So whatever trees go for furniture and byproducts of it, we create an asset class for that. Then there's a drop down value. So where is the SAM becomes a capital of the entire furniture revolution here. Why does it have to be IKEA? Sam can actually create a furniture revolution by districts, different furniture, different types for the whole world, from cane to rattan to bamboos, you know, so and, and wood. So that is one asset class. So I, I tell the finance guys, you give me an asset class, which is uh, furniture. Then I've said it for clothes and clothing. From bamboo, you can make clothing. That's what China is doing. So why don't you give us clothes and clothing as one asset class? Next is, why don't you give me for food? from mangoes to lychees to everything. It will grow differently. Elephant, apple, all the local food people have, uh, jackfruit, et cetera, et cetera. So you give me an asset class of food. And last but not least, you give me a medicinal asset class. All the medicinal plants that are there, we will we will talk to everybody and back, back steam it to see that we can, we can basically have a medicinal asset class. Last but not least, you can actually wrap this up with the tourism asset class of mindful tourism. So... If you really look at it, forests and forest forestry is really something for the future. And if you look at it even differently, from the 1700s industrial revolution, 1800s came technology to back uh, the industrial revolution. And then, you know, you came the entire revolution of IT. And now we are at the machine learning stage. I'm just doing 1700 to now fast forward. So from agriculture to technology, uh, to the industrial revolution, to technology revolution, to the cutting edge of technology, machine learning, and AI. And now I think it's the time for ecological civilization. And that's what Xi Jinping is saying. And nobody's paying heed to him now. But when China controls the ecological revolution, then everybody will say, oh, we have more forests than China. Why aren't we doing it? I think this is our chance. And that leads me on to, we call it the nature-nomics revolution. Because it's nature and economics. The interdependence between nature and economics is, in fact, the, the revolution that I'm talking about with valuing nature. McKinsey have done a lot of papers recently. We have engaged London School of Economics, Nick Stern, the leader of climate change, who you know uh, personally, I think, the uh, is that he has agreed, along with Banerjee, uh, who has recently released the climate change documents in, in the UK, to do this paper called Valuing Nature. That what is the reason why when a tree is not valued or why a building is valued? The tree has equal, forget services, like it provides oxygen, takes away carbon. I'm just saying the value of the tree. If it gives me a bitter nut over 10 years, that's my discounted cash flow. So why aren't you paying for it? So, so, so somewhere down the line, that revolution that India is waiting for is actually the naturonomics revolution. And the more we do it, the better it is. And Amitabh and I had a very good chat on my Eastern Himalayan Naturonomics Forum last year in which the Prime Minister's office was also involved, saying this is the way forward. And my request and appeal to the Chief Minister and uh, the Prime Minister is to start with an ecological budget before you go into a financial budget, because a financial budget is a derivative of, of the ecological budget. There's no ecology, there's no economy. So I think that's really the kind of stuff, I, it's a short while to describe it, but I hope I've been able to communicate that uh, in a way uh, which is understandable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ranjit. We, you know, we started with the impact of COVID in the Northeast. Uh, you know, you dwelled upon how Assam has taken it up. You also talked about the economic and social impact. Uh, you talked about the mental impact there. So you talked about the tea industry, but I think the most fascinating part uh, uh, of this conversation, of course, after that interlude of what Assam needs to do is this whole thing on nature nomics. And uh, I, I, I certainly came about uh, hugely educated by this. And I think something that Vicky will take up uh, going forward. So thank you very much uh, for your time. And then, you know, as we said, you also talked briefly about Dubai, but a lot of exciting things to do in Dubai. And we look forward to collaborating with you again on of that. Course. Thank you and keep well and stay safe.